Amen. So we're in Acts chapter 21. We're going to start off where Paul gets finally to Jerusalem. If we remember um, looking at the, the trip to Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost was warning um, Paul through Agabus and others um, that he was in danger there and that he was going to be you know, persecuted in Jerusalem. And Paul again and again says um, in Acts chapter 20 and Acts chapter 21 says, I just don't care uh, about my life. So he goes anyway. And we're going to start out at verse number 15 and see um, exactly what happens to Paul. And basically Agabus' um, prophecy in verse number 11 comes exactly true in the rest of the chapter itself. But let's look out at uh, verse number 15 um, when Paul heads over to Jerusalem. And I'm just going to make several points um, throughout um, the story and then kind of wrap it up at the, at the end here. Um, it's kind of a strange ending to a chapter. Paul begins to speak and then it's a, it's a new chapter. Um, but I'm going to make a kind of a larger point at the end. But I just want to go through what happens um, and make several points that we can apply to ourselves and to our church tonight um, in Acts chapter 21 with Paul's arrival in uh, Jerusalem and what he deals with there. Look at verse 15 is where we're going to start tonight. And after those days, we took up our carriages and went up to Jerusalem. So here they go. Paul's going. Um, he's going. Um, you know, he knows he's in danger, but he's going anyway. He doesn't care about his life. Um, so verse 16, it says, Then there went also certain disciples of Caesarea and brought with them one Nas Mason of Cyprus, an old disciple, which with whom we should lodge. When we were come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Now right away, the first thing that I thought about um, when I read through these three verses is they come to Jerusalem. So here they are, they're um, evangelists and they're traveling all over um, Paul's third missionary journey is, a, is just a mess of travels. It's hard to even map it because it's just going, he's going to so many different um, places. But he comes to Jerusalem and he comes to this church, um, the very first established church in Jerusalem. And right away it says the brethren received us gladly. Now this for us is something that you'll see in your life too. You'll see this as you go and travel and this is becoming... Um, uh, more of a popular thing that I'm seeing in the next, you know, in the last um, year um, is that people are, are going around and they're kind of traveling to different churches. They kind of know different people. And the one thing that you'll notice, you know, as we have conferences coming up in, in March and we have conferences um, coming up um, this summer, and there's always reasons to travel, especially, you know, in California, we have our own little travel circuit. You know, we're kind of in the, in the center of that travel circuit. We have Verity to the north, and then we have, of course, First Works, who we're friends with, um, to the south. Um, and I always want to say L.A., but it's, it's Anaheim. It's all L.A. to me. It's like one huge conglomeration of a metroplex, right? But, but anyway, that's the nice thing. I mean, the nice thing is, is we will experience exactly what Paul and the disciples we're experiencing here because one thing that you'll find, and maybe you say, well, I haven't traveled to that many different churches. Um, I definitely um, encourage you to go to some of these things, um, some of these activities, um, get to know some people. What, one thing you'll notice is, you know, a lot of the pastors, you know, pastors, of course, have different personalities. You know, some pastors have uh, different styles. You know, some pastors just, uh, you know, pastors are different, you know, and, and a church to a degree um, is going to be, you know, culturally different to a degree. But the funny thing is, ah, the people is always going to be, you know, is like they're just going to receive you gladly at all these churches that are, you know, based in the same Bible and based in the same beliefs as us. And you will experience this, you know, as you walk in um, to a Verity or a First Works or, or wherever else um, you would go, Sure Foundation, Faithful Word. You know, people love visitors. Look, I love visitors from other churches. We're on the receiving end of this many times. When people come, you know, traveling through here, I know many of you have met um, people from different churches, and many times we're just one stop on the way, you know, they're just stopping and visiting different churches. It's really cool to see, you know, families kind of making like a road trip vacation of, you know, just going and visiting three or four churches. My wife and, and, and I and, and our family, we've done that um, before as well. It's a, really, it's a really cool opportunity and a really awesome thing to do. But just one thing to remember is, you know, looking at, at verse number 17 is whenever people do come, whether, you know, from other churches, whether we know them or not, we should receive them gladly. You know, remember that. 
You know, remember that, you know, as Proverbs 18, 24 says, you know, that a man that hath friends must show himself friendly. Just remember, you know, we need to keep the culture of the church friendly. And that takes, it's not that we're not friendly. We are a friendly church, but I just want to always be reminding everybody of that. You know, because, look, being friendly takes effort. You know, being friendly takes us showing ourselves friendly. We want to make sure that when people come here, whether we know them or whether they're just visitors off the street, you know, that we're, you know, we're gladly receiving people, just like these people gladly received Paul and the disciples. And look, you know, the thing is, like, that takes effort. That's always going to take effort to see somebody that's new. You have to remember, I mean, we're all comfortable here, and, and we all have known each other for a long time, but you have to remember how intimidating it is coming into a group of people that you don't know. You know, it's a, it's, it can be a really intimidating thing. I remember, um, you know, going into Verity for the first time. It was just kind of like, whoa, you know, I mean, all these people. Um, it's really important that we, we go out and we reach out to people that come and visit us. Um, and you will also be on the receiving of that end of that if you go and visit other churches as well. So the point is that everybody plays a part in this. So don't ever um, forget this. Look, it's nice to be received gladly. So let's receive people gladly. Look back at Acts chapter 21. Look at verse number 18. And the day following, Paul went into us with James. Now remember James from Acts chapter 15. James is the, is the pastor. He's the, he's the leader of the church um, in Jerusalem. We kind of got that from Acts chapter 15. We'll look at that um, in just a couple minutes. But So they go in into James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry. So Paul goes in to James, and he goes into the leaders of the church, and he gives a missionary update. He goes and he tells them on, you know, because where has Paul been? He's been in Asia. He's been in Macedonia. You know, he's been in Greece. He's been all over to the Gentiles, you know, preaching to them. I mean, the Jews, of course, are chasing him anywhere he goes, but he's largely going to the Gentiles. Look at verse number 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. So they're very happy. They're like, you know, praise God that the Gentiles are getting saved. And said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe. And they are all zealous of the law. It's like, oh man, here we go, right? Here we go again. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Basically what they're saying is, this is, what, this is what the Jews are saying, that, that you're teaching everybody, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. Now look, this is, this, first of all, this is what the Jews are saying. Is this what Paul's teaching? Is Paul teaching, hey, you should not follow the law at all. You should just do whatever you want in your life. No, Paul is simply going and he is preaching the gospel, which he's preaching Jesus Christ, he's preaching salvation and the gentiles don't know the customs don't know the law and he is not preaching that because it has nothing to do with salvation paul is preaching the gospel and the jews are super offended by that i mean it's just it's more of the same it's more of the same thing that we're seeing that we saw back in acts chapter 15. as a matter of fact go back and turn there i'll read a couple more verses in acts chapter 21 and we'll look at that in just a minute so they're basically saying, look, the Jews are all still, they're still bent out of shape about this. Even the Jews that believe, they're bent out of shape that all these Gentiles are getting saved. Look, we have this big cultural clash here, is what they're saying. It's still happening. Look at verse uh, 22 of Acts 21. You're heading to Acts 15. They say, what is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this, what we say to thee. We have four men which have a vow on them. Take them and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads and may know all those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from strangled, and from fornication. So this is the same exact issue that came up in Acts chapter 15. And the same conclusion is repeated right here in verse number 
25, which a little, with a little addition, but look at Acts 15 and verse number 19. If you remember, this was Acts chapter 15 was the big discussion. It's like, okay, all the, I mean, this is the first time, okay, the Gentiles are getting saved. Nobody doubted that, but they're like, what do we do? What do we tell them to do now? Because to the Jews, the Gentiles were a bunch of godless, heathen barbarians. And here now they're getting saved. It has nothing to do with works. It has nothing to do with being circumcised or any other work or any other custom. So what do they decide to do? So they didn't change the gospel, but they're like, okay, we got all these saved people. How are we going to like, how are we going to like the multitude? Look at verse 22. They're like, the multitude must needs come together. <laughs> like, we somehow have to be, you know, a group, a church here. You know, for they will hear that thou art come. So what do we do? So in Acts 15, this was when James passed sentence. He says, wherefore, this is James speaking, wherefore my sentence is that we trouble them not, which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. Meaning, the Gentiles that get saved, we're not going to have them get circumcised, basically is what he's saying. He's like, but we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. So it's exactly the same thing that we see in verse number 25 of Acts chapter 21. So the point for us to take away here is that this is just something that just keeps coming up again and again and again. Why? Because it's part of, it's part of the culture that they're dealing with here. It's part of these, these Gentile cultures and the Jewish cultures. So, you know, I guess the application for us is don't ever feel like when you're in church... Don't ever feel like, oh man, I've heard this preached before. You know, don't ever feel like, oh, you know, pastor has, he said this, you know, two years ago. You know, he said this same doctrine. Because, look, there are several doctrines, there are several doctrines, and for good reason, I'll explain that. It's exactly the same reason as this one, by the way. But there are several doctrines that I actually have listed out that I, like, I make sure I preach every year. Several doctrines. You say, well... I mean, they actually need to be preached every year. You say, well, why? Well, to maintain the biblical culture of the church. That, that's why. Right? So don't ever feel like, oh, man, I, I, I heard. You know, he, he brings this up. You know, um, of course, I don't want to preach the same thing over and over again. Nobody wants to be a boring preacher. But the point is, a lot of it's on purpose. You know, because things like this... Just like just five chapters ago, six chapters ago, we were just talking about this in the same church in Jerusalem. But this problem, look, there's always people coming in. There's always people coming in. And guess what? Every single person that comes into the church has, they have with them the teachings of the culture of this world is what they have. So, every, I mean, every single person that needs, that comes into our church that's new, that's at maybe at a different stage of Christian growth. Maybe they just got saved last week. We have to, you know, we have to de-Hollywood them. They need to start from zero and learn, you know, all these doctrines. So that's why every single year I have a, just a whole list of basic doctrines that I make sure that I touch on. Because, look, we need to maintain the biblical core of the, this church. Otherwise, you end up with, with a, a group of, a group of people that everybody believes something different. That's not what we want. That's not what we want. So look, many things, and look, and what, here's what's really funny. Because just as, just as Solomon said, I mean, it's not really funny. But just as Solomon said, you know, that there's no new thing under the sun. It's funny because one of the main things that needs to be preached again and again today is exactly one of these things that needed to be preached again and again to these people, and that is fornication. It's interesting that just like one of the things that I make sure, I'm, I, I have to preach on fornication, like I make sure I preach on fornication, maybe I don't do a full sermon on it, you know, every th three months, but I make sure I bring up fornication many, many times in the year and throughout the preaching. You say, why? Because it is in, is it in it's ingrained in our culture today, that's why. So I know that anybody that comes in new to the church that maybe hasn't been, you know, in a Bible-believing church or a Bible-preaching church before, I know that they've been part of this culture where fornication is just universally accepted. 
So it's something that just needs to be preached again and again and again. Because look, it's, it's, it, was, it was one of the four things that James told the Gentiles they need to stop doing it. And it's one of the things that Paul brings up in 1 Corinthians 5 that is not to be allowed in the church. Look, fornication, that specific sin right there, the Bible says it's a sin against yourself. It has much danger for the individual, first of all. It has a lot of danger for the individual. It has a lot of danger for the individual physically. It has a lot of danger for the individual spiritually. Fornication can... Can, fornication from years and years and years and years and years ago can knock somebody out of the Christian life years down the road. Fornication is an extremely serious sin. And look, just for the individual, it's very dangerous in many different aspects. I mean, I'm not preaching a sermon on fornication tonight, but I just find it interesting that one of the things that... I will bring up again and again, and that James is having to bring up again and again, and Paul is the same thing because, you know, there's no new thing under the sun. And, of course, fornication is also a very big thing in the church as well. You know, the Bible is very clear that fornication, you know, cannot pervade the church. It cannot be in the church. And look, it's, it's not about, you know, beating people up, and it's not about, you know, having somebody that comes in as a new Christian, we're not going to guide them and things like this. But the Bible says that these things, look, I can't stand up here and preach against these things and preach what the Bible says if everybody's just doing whatever they want. And it's, it, it will just show everybody, especially the young people in the church, that what is preached is not really what is practiced and what is believed. Okay. So anyway, all that to say this. There's going to be doctrines that you're going to see that will just get repeated again and again and again every single year because our culture is pushing things that are against the Bible. So as, as the preacher of the Word of God, I must push back against those things as people keep coming into the church. Go back to Acts chapter 21. So look, it's, it's just what they're dealing with here. It's just more Jews are coming in, more Gentiles are getting saved, and the Jews that are believing, they're having a sa the same issue that the Jews before had. All right? So look, they kind of have, um, have a little bit of a, uh, a solution, a little bit of a, uh, an olive branch, so to speak, that they have an idea. They're like, hey, Paul, since you're this evangelist, that goes out, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. They say, since you've been going out and you've been preaching to the Gentiles and everybody thinks you're just telling them to throw the law off and, you know, the law doesn't mean anything and all these Jews that have grown up with the customs and grown up with the law, you know, they're all offended about this. They're like, we got some guys that are going through, they're at the end of their Nazarite vow. I'm not going to preach through the Nazarite vow again, but they're at the end of their Nazarite vow. They're going to go through their purification process where they shave their head and they go, you know, Paul, they're just like, hey, could you go just do that with them? So that'll kind of throw a bone or an olive branch to the people that, that are saying that you just like, you just despise the law. All right. And Paul's like, hey, no problem. Right. So Paul's going to go ahead and do this. Verse 26, you're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself with them entered into the temple to signify the accomplishment of the days of purification until that an offering should be offered for every one of them. So he goes and he participates in this Jewish custom at the end of this Nazarite vow, just to show him, hey, I don't, I don't hate the law. I don't despise, you know, the law. It's just not the gospel, is what Paul is saying. So look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. This is exactly what Paul is doing here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, which is going to lead me to another point that we see today as well. But look what Paul says. So we see Paul putting in action what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 here. So we got some Jews are all offended that the Gentiles are getting saved. They're coming in, and they just don't, they don't like what they eat. They don't like what they do. They don't like what, that they don't know anything about the law and don't practice the law. And under the Jews, look, Paul says this. He says, under the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews to them that are under the law as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. So Paul is saying here, look, when I'm out, that I might, he's talking about gaining them in Christ. He's talking about being able to preach the gospel to them, which is going to lead me to the last um, point that I have this evening. But now look at verse 21. So in verse number 20 is what we see Paul doing in Acts chapter 21. To them that are without the law, as without the law, 
Now, this is super important here because this is basically like the, the liberal Christian right here uh, can just twist this one out of, out of context. But you've got to look at the parentheses. Okay, so he says, as to those, as to them that are without the law, as without the law. So if you just took that, you could be like, oh man, Paul just goes out and just does whatever he wants just to fit in with everybody. But look at the parentheses. It says, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without the law. What he's saying here is that when he's amongst the Gentiles, he's not going out pushing all these Jewish customs on them. He's not putting all these carnal ordinances on them from circumcision to... Look, Peter got in trouble for this too. For, you know, what you should eat that's unclean and what you should eat that's clean and just kind of being like this, this prima donna, you know, with the Gentiles. He's not talking about, you know, going to the bar with them. He's not talking about going and getting into a bunch of sin because he says, I'm not without the law to God. So this is a problem today. Look, it's not a sin to get circumcised. It's not a, a sin to take a vow. It's just, or to take a Nazarite vow and to do this purification. It just doesn't have anything to do with salvation. You know, it's not a sin to follow, you know, this law. It's only bad if you add it to the gospel. That's, that's the problem. So Paul is just saying, like, look, I'm not going out and, and, and getting into fornication and going to the bar with all these people or getting into sin with these people. But see, this is where, like, lifestyle evangelism today leads. There's two problems that, that it just, this reminded me of, of, of lifestyle evangelism today. And the first one is lifestyle evangelism to people, to people that, you know, don't really go out preaching the gospel. Lifestyle evangelism really just becomes a lifestyle. <laughs> it, it just really just becomes like, okay, I'm like, I'm like uh, I, I go along with all the sinners, but I'm just not as bad as them or, or something like that. I, I, I don't know. Or they justify, you know, being along in sinful situations. And look, basically not being separate, which is the Bible, what the Bible tells us to be that come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. They justify, they justify lifestyle evangelism. They use, they use 1 Corinthians chapter 9 to say, oh yeah, you know, I just need to be amongst them. This is, this is the, the, uh, the, the Christians, the Christian denominations, which are all corrupt, by the way, the Christian denominations that say, yeah, you shouldn't take your kids out of public school because your kids should go into public school because they'll be an example to the other children in the school. Because they'll go and they'll, they'll, be, a, they'll be a witness to them through their lifestyle evangelism. Because that's what we know with kids, right? We know that the best kids always influence the, you know, the, the, the worst, right? No, it works the opposite, okay? So the first thing is it ends up just being a, a sinful lifestyle is what it ends up being for people. And the second thing is, there's no evangelism. So <laughs> this is the life, lifestyle evangelism to, you know, the liberal Christian today means, I mean, we just heard it today. Somebody told us at the door, like, you know, well, what do you need to do to go to heaven? Well, you need to spread the word. What word? What word? Have you ever been out, you know, doing what, they've never been out doing what we're doing. They're just saying, they're just saying things. They're just saying things that people repeat it. They don't know what they're talking about. There is no evangelism. This is the problem. This is how you get a church full of people. There's no evangelism. Let's, let's pretend they have the right gospel. There's no evangelism. They all look like the world. They all hang out with the world. There's no separation, and there's nothing. That, that's, that's lifestyle evangelism today. Basically, it's a cop-out is what it is. And that is exactly what Paul is not doing. So Paul says, look, when it, when it, Paul's talking about being a good soul winner in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. He's saying, hey, when I'm amongst the Jews, I'm not going to offend them with, with silly little things that have nothing to do with the gospel. And he's basically saying the same thing amongst the Gentiles. He's like, I'm just going to go amongst the Gentiles. I'm not going into sin, but I'm not going to push a bunch of stuff on them that has nothing to do with salvation. All right, so look, lifestyle evangelism today is, is exactly the opposite of what Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Everything that Paul does is, it has an end to it, and I'm going to show you what that end is um, in a few minutes. Let's keep reading. Go back to Acts chapter 21. 
Now we're going to see Agabus' prophecy come true here. Look at Acts chapter 21. Look at verse number 27. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews, which were of Asia, here they come again, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up all the people. These are the, just remember, these are the Jews of Asia where Paul has been doing a lot of his missionary journeys. Asia meaning, you know, modern-day Turkey, where he was it at the first and the second missionary journeys. He was pretty much, he was in Asia a good percentage of the time in those journeys. That, that's where the entire first missionary journey was spent in Asia. They're still after him. These are the people that stoned him, you know, thought he was dead. You know, they're still coming for him. When they saw him in the temple, they stirred up all the people and laid hands on him, crying out, men of Israel, help. This is the man that teaches all men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, and further brought Greeks also into the temple and hath polluted this holy place. I mean, talk about racist. I mean, you know, I don't believe in, you know, even the, the term, you know, I'm using a worldly term here, okay? But, I mean, talk about just, like, totally, they're not of us, you know, they're, you know, they, you've polluted this place by bringing that, that nationality of person in here. That's really the biblical term is the nationality. But look at verse 29. For they had seen before with him the city Trophimus and Ephesian. Ephesus, of course, is in Asia whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And the city, all the city was moved, and the people ran together. They took Paul, drew him out of the temple, and forthwith the doors were shut. So now they have Paul, all right? And I want you to just, just you should picture these things when you're reading this stuff, right? So they, they got him. They, they seized him, all right? And as they were about to kill him, tidings came unto the chief captain of the band that all Jerusalem was in an up, uproar who immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down unto them. And when they saw the chief captain and the soldiers, they left beating of Paul. So here's the timeline of events here. So they grab Paul out of the temple and begin beating him to kill him. They begin trying to beat him to death, okay? And it takes, they're beating him to death until word can get to the, I mean, they don't have like, you know, text messages and, and you know, Instagram or whatever else, you know, it's not like, it's not like the chief captain of the band is getting paged. Like, dee, 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 we got a problem here. It's like somebody went over to the chief captain of the, at the Roman garrison, wherever that was, you know, told him, hey, we got a problem in the, in the temple, you know, outside the temple. Like, the whole time they're beating Paul, trying to beat him to death, okay? And, you know, finally, you know, he gets, he gets the soldiers together. He ran down unto them. They saw the chief captain and soldiers. They left beating of Paul. So, I guess the only point I'm trying to make in verse number, you know, 20, 21, and, or 30, 31, and 32 is that, you know, probably, Paul is probably in pretty bad shape at this point. You know, probably he took a little bit of a beating here. It's not like they just shook him up a little bit and then this guy was suddenly right there. All right, the word had to get to him. He had to get his people together, get over there, and stop this. All right, so look, the Gentiles, so this is exactly what Agabus said in verse number 11, right? That he would be brought into, he would be given into the hands of the Gentiles, Gentiles being who? The Romans, all right? That's who we're talking about here. Look at verse 33. Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and demanded who he was and what he'd done. He's like, hey, what's going on here? It's like, these Jews are causing trouble again. This is, this is getting, you got to understand the situation in Jerusalem too. This is very close to when, like, the temple, I mean, we're talking like within 10 years of the Romans just being like, we're done with this. And they're just going to kick all the Jews out of Jerusalem. There's this big war, and that's when the temple is destroyed in 70 A.D., all right? So, like, they're getting, you know, they're already irritated with the situation. So, um, he's asking, what's going on? What have you done? You know, what, what has this guy done? And they all scream out. Some cried one thing, some another. It's this huge mob. And when he could not know the certainty for the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle, when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. So he was like, literally like, had to be carried up the stairs at this point because he had been beaten so bad, all right? So he was basically carried up the stairs, and the people are still trying to get at him. For the multitude of people followed after crying, away with him. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, so now you've got to just remember who's talking here. Paul says to the chief captain, may I speak unto thee? Who said, now the captain's speaking, okay? Who said, canst thou speak Greek? And then the captain is still speaking in verse number 38. 
All right, that can be a little confusing. It says, art, thou not that, art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days madest an uproar and ledest out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers. So this chief captain thinks that he's this guy that basically led this, this violent insurrection or, or whatever, right? He, he, uh, he assumes that he's this leader of, in verse number 38, this is the chief captain. Now in verse 39, we see Paul replies and says, but Paul said, now Paul starts to tell him like who he is. Paul said, I am a man, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. A, you know, this is an interesting statement here. He says, a citizen of no mean city. So what he's saying there is, is I have to assume that this captain knows what he's talking about. No mean city means I am a citizen of no ordinary city or no, and so the captain is immediately going to know that Paul is saying, I am a Roman citizen here, okay? So Paul is basically telling the captain, like, I'm a Jew, okay? I'm a Jew, and I'm from a city in Sicilia, but the most important thing is where he's a citizen of, all right? He's a citizen of Rome, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. So he kind of pulls his I mean, because Paul is a Roman citizen, and he, he, we find that out, you know, in a much more direct way later. But Paul's a Roman citizen, and Paul has been beaten probably nearly to death, and he pulls out this card, like, I just want to talk to you. He's like, I just want to, oh, no, he says, I want to speak unto the people. And, and the, you know, why? Because he's saying, because I'm a Roman citizen, let me speak to the people. All right? Look at verse number 40. And when he had given him license, so it, it worked. I mean, he basically said to the chief captain, let me speak to the people. I'm a Roman citizen. I'm a Jew and a Roman citizen. Let me speak to the people. And the captain allows it. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And he said, and when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, and I'm not going to go into the speech that Paul gives, but here's the point I want to make, all right? Here's the, the point I want to make at the end of this sermon there's major trouble here. Again, Paul is protected by God. He is, he is, just as verse 11 said, Agabus said Paul would be taken by the Gentiles. That happened. That was fulfilled. Paul uses the fact that he's a Roman citizen to give him permission to speak to this mob. Okay? Now he's up there. He's beaten half to death, and he has the opportunity to speak to this mob to do what? To explain himself? To, to calm them down? To, to get so they don't want to hurt him anymore? No, Paul gets up there and he uses all his methods and means with this chief captain to get opportunity to speak to the people to preach the gospel. Paul was in constant soul winning mode. I mean, think about it. He is beaten half to death this whole time. They have to carry him up the stairs. Lord knows what he looks like at this point and what he feels like and what he can do, but he's, he's just like, he just constantly just, I mean, isn't this what Paul said in, in Acts chapter 20, in Acts chapter 21, I don't care about my life? Like, apparently he was not just saying words. Apparently he meant it. He cared nothing about his life. All he was looking for was just another way to be able to preach the gospel to this group of people that had just tried to kill him. So I guess the takeaway here, I have, I have two points. I have two points tonight with, with what Paul just went through. And look, he gets up and he preaches the gospel, and we'll look at that in, ver in chapter 22 next week. But the point is, we need to be confrontational with the gospel. You say, what do you mean? Here's the problem. Nobody wants to confront anyone today. Paul was in constant soul winning mode. And he was constantly, were, were these people confrontational? Were these people upset with what he was saying? Yes, they were. And he was still confronting them with the gospel. Look, we're not, when we go out, that's why we do, that's why it's, it's actually, you actually call it confrontational soul winning when we go out soul winning. But the point is, we're not out there trying to be jerks. Don't get me wrong. You know, we're not out there trying to be jerks to people. But hey, at the end of the day, 
if you're going to do this whole lifestyle evangelism, where I'm going to be, I'm going to try to get to be best friends with somebody, and I'm going to become a missionary that has to go somewhere, and I don't speak the language, and I'm going to learn every custom and every, every piece of the language for three years before I even bring up the word Jesus to somebody. I mean, the point is, you know, if it's not going to work anyway, because there's not going to be that perfect moment where you can preach the gospel to somebody and they won't be offended. It's, it's a complete waste of time. And that, that is what you see today, is just this, nobody wants to confront anyone today. We can't, we can't, I mean, look, Christians are buying into this. Christians are buying into this. We don't want to, we just don't want to offend some other belief or some other doctrine or whatever. But the point is, folks, that, and the second point is you need to get to that moment of confrontation in order to get somebody saved. You need to be there. Wait, what you say, why? Because people need to realize that they are wrong. People need to realize that their belief that they have is incorrect. Because that is how you are saved, by repenting from that false belief, whatever it may be, whatever, kind of, whatever version of works soup that is, repenting from that and changing your mind and believing and trusting only on Jesus. Look, people have to get to that point. And you know what that takes? It takes confrontation of that belief. That's what it takes. This is what repent actually means they have to know the difference between believing that you can lose your salvation and believing that you can't in eternal security. That difference must be made clear to people. Otherwise, it's the difference between salvation and not. And now, now look, people that are great soul winners, people that are great soul winners, I mean like just really great soul winners, they're very likable, and they, they can many times do this confrontation in a way, in a way that shows that they are doing it because they care, not because they're trying to win a debate or win an argument or prove that they're right or whatever. These are the great soul winners are the people that can go and really make personal connections with people. Where somebody, and, I mean, and to make a personal connection with somebody you just met, you know, look, you're not going to learn that in one day. You're not going to learn that in one week. That takes years and years and years of going out and, and just presenting people with the gospel, confronting people with the gospel. But here's the thing, folks. Whether you're good at it or not as good at it, if you don't have a humble person sitting in front of you, it's, it's not going to make any difference. The best soul winner could go up to a, a, a person that's prideful and that is, that is stuck in their beliefs, and the best soul winner is not, is not going to be able to break down that pride. While that person has a heart problem, there's nothing we can do there, no matter how great of a soul winner that you are. But look, door-to-door, -door, another thing, door-to-door -door soul winning is just the beginning. It's just the beginning. You think about Paul here, how he was just constantly, you know, he's being dragged up these stairs. He's constantly thinking, how can I get permission to speak to these people? Why? So I can preach the gospel. How can I, how can I find another opportunity to preach the gospel here? That's what he's thinking. And he uses his, he uses the fact that where he's from, he uses the fact that what he's a citizen of, he's throwing all kinds of cards out there. Why? Not to get himself out of chains, but to be able to speak the gospel more. Not to, you know, not to win an argument, but the point is, we have to be, you know, not afraid of confrontation. Because Paul, these people were upset. Why were they upset in the first place? They were upset because he was preaching the gospel. So he gets all this permission to go and just, like, confront them again with the gospel. Look, folks, we're not trying to win arguments here. You know, we're not trying to win debates here. But the thing you have to understand is, like, hell is on the line. You know, I mean, you look at, you know, people will say, oh, you know, why do you, have to, why do you have to be so hard on the Catholics? You know, why do you have to be, you know, so hard uh, on the Mormons? Why do you have to be 
so difficult, Pastor Jared, on Pentecostals all the time? It's because we love them, that's why. It's because we actually care about them. Now, I don't love the people that are teaching them those things. I mean, even the, we, we met a Baptist today who told us he's at his church. He says, I go to a Baptist church and we're discussing all the time how to get to heaven. And we just don't know. And I told the, the people we were soloing with, I was like, you know, that kind of pastor that's leading a church just to say he's a leader of a church, has no idea what the gospel is, isn't saved, and is leading people astray like that, that guy's going to be next to Hitler in hell. I don't care what his denomination is or whatever. Because look, folks, hell is real. And you're, you are going to have to be willing to offend in order to you know, get people to the truth. But look, this is what you're seeing today. It's just we want to just be lighter. We want to just be lighter with people. Just lighter, lighter. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to preach. I don't want to preach about hell from the pulpit anymore. I just want to be lighter. I just want to be lighter. I don't want to bring up hell. You don't hear about hell today in Christian churches today. You're not going to hear, you know, some fire-breathing sermon about how the unsaved people are going to go to hell. So you don't, so you just take hell out. We'll just take hell out of the, out of the preaching. I, I know it's in the Bible, but we'll just take it out. Because people don't like to hear that. People don't like to hear, because you know what? All these people in my church that aren't separated, that, that, are, that are going to, you know, family events all the time with all their, their Catholic and Pentecostal and Protestant and, and Jehovah's Witness and Mormon, you know, family members and whatever, they don't like to think about the fact that they might be going to hell. That it's even a possibility. So let's just take it out. The problem is, it's not true. About this, let's not talk about sin anymore. Let's talk about, let's, talk, let's just, you know, everything's okay. Everything's okay. Somebody told me, uh, somebody told me the other day, and I finally found the verse. This is so funny that this happened. Like three weeks ago, you know, somebody that um, we were out preaching, I think this person ended up getting saved, but they're like, yeah, you know, come as you are. That's what the Bible says. And I'm just like, Man, I, mean, I was just thinking, like, Garrett and I were just batting this one around a little bit, like, wonder what verse they think that that's, that's coming from. And you know what it is? I saw a plaque in a store, like, three days later, John 6, 37. The plaque, it literally, it was a cross. Go ahead and turn there. Go ahead and turn there. Well, let's turn there together. John 6, 37. The plaque, and you know, one of these little gift shops, when you buy all these cute little Bible sayings that you hang on your refrigerator, and, and it said, John 6, 37. Here's what it said, come as you are, quote, unquote, John 6, 37. Look at this. And I'm like, oh, man, I like, I'm just, I like, apparently. So I, we turn, you know, turn there, John 6, 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. That means come as you are. Like every single wicked, murdering, pervert, whatever, just come on in. That's what that means. It's just like, what in the world? You know, I mean, but that's what it said. Come as you are, John 6, 37. And I, I, I wouldn't even have guessed that verse to, to mean that. But the point is, that's what happens when you have, you know, just this lighter and lighter and lighter attitude. And, oh, we don't want to talk about fornication. We don't want to talk about sin. We don't want to talk about, you know, how we should be separate or how we should look different or act different or any of these things. You know, because the Bible just, it's not part of the gospel, but we don't want to talk about these things in the Bible. But that's where this leads. Because it's all because nobody wants to offend anyone today. But here's the problem, folks. You know that all these churches that don't teach hell, they don't teach, first of all, they all, most of them have false gospels, but these churches that don't teach these things that would offend people, turn to John 15 and verse number 18. John 15 and verse number 18. The thing that you have to understand, the thing that you have to understand is that Jesus told us in John 15, 18, he said, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. The thing that you have to understand is it's not the preaching on sin. It's not hell. It's not, and yes, we are going to talk to people about hell. 
Yes, we're going to go to the door. I can't believe you go to somebody's door and tell them they're going to go to hell. You bet we do. Because that's what the Bible says. And, and look, if, if I lie to people, do I love them? If we go and we lie to people, that's why that preacher that stands up and he lies to his congregation, that false prophet that lies to his congregation has no right, you know, just getting up there just for his own filthy lucre's sake, getting up there telling people good news, good news, good news, sending everybody to hell, he's going to be, he's going to be as low or lower than anybody else in hell. But yeah, you're, we get up there and we tell them, hey, you're a sinner. You, yeah, yeah, this is what you're facing right now. I remember feeling that after I got saved and then I knew people that I knew that were saved and I saw them years later and I was like, why in the world didn't you tell me? I was mad at them. This one specific guy. I was like, I asked him first. I said, I got to see him a couple years later and I said, you knew I wasn't saved, didn't you? And he said, yeah, I did. I was like, thanks, jerk face. You know, I was, you know, then we laugh at it. But, I mean, I'm serious. Thanks a lot, but no, no, no. We don't want to offend anybody. Please offend me. Hey, if I'm walking towards, like, a wood chipper and I'm going to fall off a cliff and, and, you know, die, please let me know. But this is, this is what's happening today because we don't want to offend anybody. That's why we confront people. That's why we're confrontational. Look, I want to be as good at it as I possibly can be. But at the end of the day, it's the gospel that offends. That's the problem. So don't be like, oh man, I, I just, I, I'm nervous to, to bring up the hell verses because, because, no, it's the gospel that offends, folks. It's the gospel that offends. All you can do is sincerely have a heart that cares and hope you're talking to somebody that has a humble heart. And if you're talking to somebody that has a humble heart, they will accept it. Because it, none, of, none of the other stuff makes any sense at all. So look, this is what we see with Paul here. This is what we see with Paul here. And you know what? Um, you'll see this. You go on mission trips, you'll see this. You'll see this. You'll see people that are just like, you know, I mean, we go on mission trips, and, and there'll be soul winning times from this time to this time, and this time to this time. And then you'll see certain people that are just like, they're just like in soul winning mode for like the whole week. And they're just getting like double the salvations, like triple the salvations of everybody else, because like they're going out to dinner getting people saved. They're just like constantly just looking for that you know, way to just work the conversation into somebody else, you know, from that place that we're at or whatever. And that was Paul. Paul was just in constant soul winning mode. And he, look, he was not afraid to confront people with the gospel. So look, don't think like, oh man, you know, a bunch of people got offended today when I went out and preached the gospel. Jesus offends people. Jesus said, I, I came here to divide. This is a fake Christianity. This fake Christianity that Jesus wants to just bring everyone together. No, Jesus said, I divide people. He said, I divide households. If you go out and you preach the gospel like you're supposed to preach, he's like, even fathers and mothers and daughters and sons will be divided over it. And look, because it's confrontational, the gospel offends people. So don't feel like, oh man, you know, I'm going to go out and I'm, that's, that's, I mean, that's the way it is. I tell you this so, so you, you're not offended. You know, so when you go out and you preach the gospel to people and this happens, you know you're doing it right. You know you're doing it correctly because that's exactly what happened to Paul and that's exactly who he was his whole life. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.